Dude, actually converted Pierce Morgan with that conversation? No, I think Pierce Morgan is like over the course of of uh, many uh, weeks now. I, I think like he's, he's, I wouldn't say he's like an honest person by any means, okay? That's the side that can end the conflict. Uh, and it was, yeah, and actually we agreed. Anyway, let's watch Basim Yusuf yeah, yeah. versus Piers Morgan now. I was done about you. Maybe you weren't surprised. I was completely staggered by the response globally to our interview several weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Were you taken aback by the Bro, he's such a cloud shark. He, uh, yes, he changed, he, he switched sides, bro. I, I swear to God. The only um, side that matters right now for you, years, though, the media, is the top of the hour ad break avoidance side. Has, uh, been um, showing a certain point of view. I'm not Third streamer doesn't know about DNS two two two. Bitch, I've been in America for that reason. It did not allow certain voices, certain um, voices from the other side to be heard, and that is why you see the frustration. You all, whenever you speak to people in the Middle East, they tell you the same thing. Uh, they 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 not very happy with the the coverage of Middle East because our voices are not heard. Now, I am the least qualified person ever to talk about this conflict, and yet just because. I relate some of the talking points that we say and we hear the whole time. Mm. People felt heard. And when, you, when, when people have this feeling, they, they, they're happy. They, are, they, 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 they have this response. They said, oh my God, for the, for the first time, the West are actually hearing our point He's of so view. right. Some of the points He's of view so might not right. be, go well with other people, but at least we have a conversation. And I think that is the reason why people reacted that way. Uh, yeah. It's, it's such an incendiary subject matter i've never seen social media so ablaze with hostility on on both sides did you actually as well as enormous praise from the arab world did you also get criticized by some parts of the arab world for not going perhaps oh, hard yeah. enough oh you didn't do that you didn't do that no. the thing is this is like uh, you're damn if you do you're damn if you don't right if you don't speak up, why don't you speak up? If you speak up, you didn't speak up. Whatever. If you're I done, hope, why are you do, uh, If you speak up too much, oh. I hope Pierce doesn't just like fucking use uh, Bussem's like media interest, like because he's a media guy, to just like drive the conversation away to Show dumb shit on social media. But yeah, there was a backlash, but there's also a backlash from the other side, which um, I, I mean, here. Mm. and other comedy clubs. I worked with people from all kinds of different backgrounds. Mm. Uh, Jewish, Christians, Muslims, mm. Arabs, atheists, all kinds of people. And there are a lot of people who went to, to my socials like, oh, so you're a terrorist sympathizer now, you know? And uh, I think it is important to have uh, <clears throat> a nuanced, deep, interesting, intelligent conversation. A lot of people waiting for this mm. are kind of like, yeah, Basim, bury Pierce, mm. show him. And this is the problem with the news today. The problem is the news today, it's not about the news anymore. Mm. It's about the people giving you the news. Mm. So it becomes a show, a circus. Two gladiators in the Colosseum. <laughs> two pigs fighting in the mud. And this is why people don't get anything out of it. It's a circus. You know, one of the things I heard a lot was, who is this guy? <laughs> And they weren't talking about me. Sometimes, <laughs> then, I, sometimes I won't. <laughs> now, obviously, you're very, very well known in the Arab world. You're known as the kind of, they called you the Arab John Stewart. And you're well known in America. But you weren't that well known, for example, in the UK. Mm. Uh, and I think what this interview did, it, it made a lot of people think, wow, all right, this, this is incredible. Mm. But tell me more about Bassam Yusuf. And I, I did a bit of research into your life. And it is a fascinating journey that you've gone on to get here mm. to Los Angeles. And I think it's worth just taking a little beat here to talk about this, because you began in Cairo as a heart surgeon. I mean, yeah. that was your career path. Yes. And, yes. You, and you were a heart surgeon. I was a heart surgeon until, yeah. Uh, I, I spent 19 years in that career, seven years in medical school, 12 years as a practicing doctor. And uh, 2011 happened and the revolution happened and I had my own show on YouTube. I did like small vi videos. Well, and, I'm gonna to come to this because yeah. I was in, I, by coincidence, I had just joined CNN to replace the great Larry yes. King. And I hadn't actually done any live show. I'd done a few weeks since I joined of taped interviews with big names, Donald Trump, Oprah Winfrey, things like that. And I was flying back to Los Angeles when I got a message that Egypt was going up in the start of the Arab Spring. And I actually went to a studio very near here, about a mile down the road on Sunset, the CNN studio, the old Larry King studio. And I went live for the first time and it was about the Arab Spring. It was about what was happening in Egypt. And at the same time, you in Egypt were actually in Tahrir Square helping wounded protesters, actually 
medically treating them. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, this was a kind of movement that inspired a lot of Egyptians. Um, at the time, I was, you know, I was in the hospital, and a, a lot of people just had volunteered. Oh. And the, the nurses were just like giving us like supplies, go, 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 and we were going there, and we were basically tending to the wounded because it is, and and it kind of gives you a different perspective when you see helpless, <coughs> defenseless people who do who are not armed. Mm -hmm. They are being beaten by security forces, military forces, being shot, being, uh, you know, hurt. And uh, all we can do is just like provide some medical attention. And it kind of gives you a perspective to see how humanity sometimes can show its most ugly face. And the suppression of free speech, freedom yeah. of expression, yeah. the ability of people to say what they honestly feel about a situation, yes. and the suppression of people's basic rights to freedom. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, that kind of like uh, taught me a lot and, uh, and inspired me to do the show. But you know... Well, well you start, it's a crazy story this, and I, I want to tell it because you just decided to do <laughs> five minute stuff on YouTube, yeah. and you were expecting a few people to watch yeah. it. And then, literally, it just flies, and suddenly right. you're getting millions of people watching this. And very quickly, one of the big networks comes in, mm. and then you're suddenly doing this stuff for 30 to 40 million people. Yeah. Like a third of the entire population of Egypt yeah. is tuning in to watch it. You're the biggest star of Egyptian television. Oh, please. But you were. Don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, I mean, what an extraordinary thing, though, for a heart surgeon yeah. to go from helping protesters medically in Tahrir Square, the start yeah. of the Arab Spring, to within a year, you're the biggest star on Egyptian television. It's, it's a crazy it thing. Do, it, it doesn't sound as glamorous. As Stop, dude. Why? Dude, this is so dumb. Anyone who knows they have a fucking moment of opportunity in fucking Western media in front of such a large audience knows that the goal is to fucking talk about Palestinians, talk about Palestinians, talk about Palestinians. Stop glazing yourself up, man. Holy shit. I think he's very good. I think he's he's very good at at talking about the situation on the ground. But it's like I don't I don't ugh, fuck. Can you just explain how the media people become the highlight of the news and transition into glazing each other? Yeah, I know. I hate this. There's many, many reasons. This is why I did not want to fucking have a conversation with Piers Morgan about like propaganda or who's a propagandist or whatever. Not because like, oh, it's an indefensible position. No, I, I love debating. I, no matter how much I fucking abhor debate pervertry, I debate for fucking hours, okay? I'm stubborn as shit. I'm a stubborn motherfucker. It's just that right now, this is an idiotic fucking time to talk about it. It's selfish. It was a warrant for my arrest, and then I turned myself in, and I was interrogated... And it was the funniest interrogation ever. And in my stand-up shows, I, I, I talk about that scene. Because the guards were reading the stuff out and laughing, right? Well, the guards were taking selfies with me, which is funny. Right. <laughs> and and, the, uh, and, the, and it, the exchange between me and the inter and persecutor, a uh, general persecutor, was extremely funny. I mean, I don't like to victimize myself. I don't like, oh, look at that. I actually like to find humor. But why were the, you arrested? What was the criteria? Oh, yeah. The, I, I think the list was insulting Islam insulting the president, spreading false rumors, and disrupting the fabric of society. And, uh, and uh, it was, I think the people in the room didn't know what to do with me mm. because they ended up discussing my jokes. So it turned into a writer's room. And I, I was kind of like, how do you think we make this funnier? And it was the funniest exchange ever. And after six hours, I, I was let go. Mm. And uh, Was it scary, though, at the same time, that suddenly the machinery was getting a grip of you because it was to get a lot scarier. But was it in that moment when you first got arrested, you thought, I'm being arrested for breaching my freedom of speech, right? It, for some reason. Oh my God. I, I, I just like went with the flow. I went to the interrogation wearing the big hat. I went to the show. It, it was. I don't want to talk about like internal Egyptian politics. Okay. And, and I have, Stop short of discussing like Bassem Youssef's own personal perspective on Egyptian politics in general. I hate that like there's a Israel at war ticker on the bottom of the fucking show and they're just like talking about this shit. 
Hassan, the interview is two hours. You got to chill. I know, but this is the most important part of the interview. This is the part that people watch. And the part that people watch is just like his background. Interesting story because the first episode that was aired after the removal of the Muslim Brotherhood, everybody was waiting to see what I would say. Because by that time... Well, now he's talking about it. Okay, were, never mind. Like me and me and Islamic Shad, like it's like they had five channels and they were like me and mm -hmm. them going like that. They, they had like five channels and have only one hour a week. And then they were removed. And then a lot of the other dissident voices were also being shut down. Now, our people are waiting. What will Basim say? Mm. Yeah, and what will he say? on the day that the show aired... I know what he said. The next day I went... I went out and everybody like, good, good, at least somebody is speaking. It was a very controversial episode. Nobody liked it. And yet everybody liked it. Because people said like, you're supporting the coup. No, you're the Muslim Brotherhood. Everybody accused me of something. All I did in that episode was just being a mirror of what is happening in the street and showing them how ridiculous it is. You didn't take your fixed position. Well, my position, depending on where, where what's your position? What did you intend your position? To? My, my position was to show the ridiculousness of <clears throat> how the pe people now was like, oh, we got rid of Islamic fascism, but we are heading towards another fascism. Mm. Uh, there was, and there was a song that I did that was very controversial. People, and it's very funny, the, the pro-Muslim Brotherhood thought that this is a disrespect to the people who died. And on the other side, the people said that this is a disrespect mm -hmm. to the army. And when you manage to offend everybody, you know you're right. Yes. Oh and then the God. people in the middle is like, oh, you weren't you weren't tough enough. And yeah. I was told, it's like, why didn't you go after it? The, 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 free, the ceiling of freedom just went down and I was just like, it was very difficult. It is very difficult to go against pa uh, an, uh, an authority that, is very, that was very popular at the time. And especially a military authority with oh, all, yeah. the, all of experience <sighs> oh, yeah. of weaponizing these situations. Yeah. You had death threats. People would always choose, most of the time, they would always choose the military form rather than the religious form because mm. they, they kind of like, uh, at least they are not infringing on my personal freedom, not yet. But, uh, but you had threats on your life, didn't you? Oh, all the time. I don't talk about that because like, I have been having death threats like never stopped since 2011, never stopped. Have they continued since our last interview? Oh yeah, they never stopped. People threatening to kill you? All the time. Why? For what reason? Oh, uh, for just saying something that they don't like. Oh, because you you are against uh, Egypt, you're against Islam, you're against our... The problem is, the guy that was fucking overthrown was a popularly elected Muslim Brotherhood guy. And the issue is that he was overthrown with a violent military coup, okay? And the violent military coup that took place that also killed a shit ton of fucking protesters, as a matter of fact, was conducted by U.S.-aligned US aligned forces that were supposedly fucking liberal. Oh, what the fuck? What's going on? Is there an ad break? What? They just hit us with a commercial break? The problem always, the problem always is that, and Sisi, who they now have, was a high-ranking official in the security forces, yeah, the, the problem is always that your vote for Islamic Brotherhood, no way, no the issue always when it comes to affairs in other countries is that it is more complex than the way you understand it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like anything and everything that people do, anything and everything that people do, if it does not serve America's interests, will always be used against them. So the people always are stuck between a rock and a hard place, okay? Most of it was only popular amongst Muslim Brotherhood members and people wanted them out but didn't want another military piece of shit, but the revolution got hijacked. This has happened time and time again in... I mean, this has happened in Turkey as well. This happens everywhere. It also... It, I mean, it's a, it's a constant. It's a constant in places like Turkey as well. It's a constant in places like Iran as well. You have, uh, you have Western influence that creates, that creates a lot of anger in the, and resentment in the population, a lot of death and destruction at the behest of Western-backed leadership that causes people to find emancipation in the most reactionary forces, in the most reactionary groups, in the most reactionary ideologies, okay? Like, Iran is right there. It is a perfect representation of this. It is seen as an anti-Western force. And of course, they are brutal. Of course, they are uh, uh, theocratic. Of course, they're awful. Not a single person, not a single leftist, for example, 
uh, living in Iran will tell you otherwise. Like nobody wants to live under a, a, a theocratic dictatorship, okay? Nobody. It's not great. But you can't have a democratic process if you're constantly fucking waging war against the most important, most powerful military machine on the planet. With your lawyer said, you gotta get out of it. You gotta get out of Egypt. It's yeah. getting too dangerous. Yeah. Something bad's gonna happen. You're gonna yeah. get arrested again and probably sung in jail or you're gonna, you're gonna try and kill you. And you flee to Dubai mm -hmm. and then you end up here yeah. in America. Yes. Was that always the plan to eventually come to America or was it expediency because of what happened? Well, it's funny that you said that because I visited the United States after the first year of my show. Mm. And uh, um, a doctor that's there, an Egyptian doctor has been there for, for a while, I said, listen, Bessem, you, you are very visible in the media, and I think you can use that to apply for a green card as a special talent. And I did. And it's like, I, I, I have like a huge show in It's actually the criteria, because I have the same, yeah. is uh, an alien of exceptional ability. Yes. Is what they call you. Yes, we're very, Charmingly. Yes, we're very We're exceptionally able aliens. We are, but we're still aliens. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know, it always makes me laugh. <laughs> yeah. like you can come here, but you are an alien. You're an alien, but you're exceptional. Yeah. And uh, I, um, I just I, I applied for it, and I got it. Uh, I got the Time 100 that helped bo both from my... Uh, my application, and said, ah, maybe I'm not going to leave. And then when that happens, ooh, the green card came handy. Mm. So a lot of people think that I'm here on asylum. I'm not. I just, it was just a, a, a strike of luck. You now do stand up. Mm -hmm. and you've done it for five years. And fascinatingly, you do some of it for an Arab audience. You have a whole in Arabic. Arabic and, a, and an English speaking yes. version. Yes. And they're probably very different, right? Totally because different. Different sensibilities, different humor, yeah. different crowds, yes. different expectation. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, when the uh, Arab audience come to my show, they expect that's going to be another version of my show that I did in Egypt. And I said, no, it's a my personal story. Even then, this weekend, right before I met you, because of our interview, I sold out Arizona. Really? <laughs> yes. And I, and, I, and I stood, and the first... Oh, my God. I, I don't like this. This gives me more respect for commentators like you didn't flinch from the topics in weeks. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think that this is like... Do you want to know how little... Uh, anyone cares about Egypt? Check this, the Rabah massacre. Yeah. On August 14th, 2013, the Egyptian police and to a lesser extent, the armed forces under the command of then Defense Minister Abdel Fattah el-Sisi dispersed two camps of protesters in Cairo, one at the Al-Nahda Square and a larger one at the Rabah al-Adawiya Square, the two sites that had been occupied by supporters of President Mohamed Morsi, who had been removed from office by a military little over a month earlier following mass protests against his rule, okay? Initiatives to end the six-week sit-ins by peaceful means had failed, and the camps were cleared out within hours. Human Rights Watch described the sit-in dispersals as crimes against humanity and called them one of the world's largest killings of demonstrators in a single day in recent history in reference to the numerous deaths that occurred. The exact death toll during the incident is unclear and multiple sources have given conflicting estimates. Human Rights Watch states that at least 904 protesters were killed, 817 in Rabah Square and 87 in al Nahda Square, while strongly suggesting that at least 1,000 protesters died during the dispersal. The Egyptian Health Ministry announced that 593 protesters and 43 police officers were killed and at least 300... Uh, and 3,994 individuals are injured. I will not be showing you the actual photos. Oh, they do have some of the casualty photos. Okay. The background is, following the 2011 Egyptian revolution, which ousted Hosni Mubarak and subsequent instability, mass protests calling for the resignation of President Mohamed Morsi culminated in the 2013 Egyptian coup d'etat. Prior to the anti-Morsi uprising, supporters of the deposed president occupied two squares, Rabah al adawiya in Nasser City in Cairo and al Nahda in Giza, originally to celebrate the one-year anniversary of his presidency, but from, three, from the 3rd of July onwards to protest his ouster, vowing to remain there until Morsi was reinstated. Authorities delayed clearing the two protest camps as internal and external recon reconciliation. Uh, reconciliation processes were established to attempt to resolve this crisis peacefully. According to the military, the sit-ins were flashpoints for outbreaks of violence and bloody confrontations among pro-Morsi and anti-Morsi demonstrators and security forces. Oh, they're on Palestine now? Okay, let's talk. About, all right, let's get back to this. We'll talk. Nations. We'll cover Egyptian politics so, and how important it is to Palestinian now, politics I'm ready again. For you, okay? This time I'm ready for the humor. <laughs> oh, you're ready. Okay. No, but it's interesting because last time I was very taken aback. <laughs> and I remember thinking as you were doing this at the, right off the top, 
I remember feeling very uncomfortable, unusually uncomfortable, and thinking I didn't know how to react to that. I didn't know whether I was supposed to laugh or be silent, or and I sort of ended up sort of slightly grimacing. Doesn't mean to take some Palestine listening. are wrong. They're not. And I realized it was very powerful what you were doing. It was satirical, but it was savagely satirical and extremely effective. And that's why I think the interview did so well. You know why? Because all I did was just take the talking points that's been in the media, mm. not just for mm. after October 7th, all through the conflict. It's always like, we need to kill it. All right. You need to kill five? No, kill 10. You need to kill some? No, kill all. This is what satire does. You take, uh, take reality, flip it on its head, exaggerate it, and then you can see how sometimes very uncomfortable and even sometimes stupid that sounds. Mm. Because I, I, I was just reacting to whatever the media is telling me. It's like, oh, yeah, okay, okay do it. Come, mm. um, there's no pushback. So suddenly, the person who was proposing the most extreme measures, like, oh, we're taking, oh, no, 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 no that's too much. So that, that was like a very simple technique. I just talk, took the talking point and just exaggerated it. Was, it was devastatingly effective, I yeah. thought. Um, first, before we go any further, how is your wife's family? Because she is half Palestinian. Yeah. Are they okay? Are no, they... They're, they're good. They're good. They are safe for now. Yeah. Um, and as like the last week, there was no internet, as you have. Yes. You know, I, I saw you tweet at the IDF. It's like, how can they know? You if know how many uh, views that tweets had? Nearly 40 million. Yeah. Me just saying, how are they going to see this message if you've cut the yeah. internet off? Yeah. I'm, I'm Activists who led the, the revolution IDF, in 2011 like, protested again after Morsi like insisted he had powers of the constitution didn't it. give him. The rule of law <laughs> wasn't honored, and this conflict led to the military yeah. taking Correct. advantage of the situation. Yes, There's a lot of context that the Wikipedia article can't give. That tweet I did was enormous, as everything is in this, mm. in this thing. And I had a lot of people say, finally, Piers, you get it, right? Finally, you get it. And, and I wanted to say, listen, I'm, I'm trying to reach a place where I get this, but mm -hmm. it's an incredibly complicated issue mm -hmm. for someone who is not Arabic or Jewish to poke their head into. And I've had to cover it as a journalist for a long, long time. I think I said to you before that I was editor of a Daily Mirror in England when we opposed the Iraq war, for example. So, you know, I have taken stands on this thing. On this one, I find, and I'm going to be completely straight with you. I discussed this with Jordan Peterson. Um, like, I don't think the Israeli apartheid regime is complicated, but if you're going to talk about, in which if said, you're going to talk about Egypt, Netanyahu it is certainly more enough. complicated. And he was actually very self-reflective about that in the interview we did this week, where he later issued a 20-minute video, because he said sometimes a, a one-line tweet can be unnecessarily inflammatory to people. Much better to take time to explain it. Here's, here's where I've got to with this conflict now. I viewed what happened on October the 7th as a, an absolutely appalling atrocity, a terror attack of unimaginable horror. And I absolutely think that Israel has a right to defend itself from the people who committed it, Hamas. And I've questioned for the last three, four weeks what is a proportionate response? And I have said repeatedly, I don't know the answer. I want people who have a view to have a view about that. And I'll ask you again about where you think we are with this. I also acknowledge that Hamas live amongst civilian population in Gaza. And therefore, if you do what the Israelis are currently doing, which is a ground offensive into Gaza, a lot of civilians are going to get killed. And at what point does that become disproportionate or even illegal and I don't know the answers to those questions. And I have a moral quandary because my instinct is to say that Israel has no choice but to respond to what happened in a very forceful manner. I understand why they want to eliminate Hamas altogether. I understand that if they feel they can, then perhaps we can move to a, a, a two-state solution or peace or whatever it may be, although I don't think Netanyahu will ever be the person to do that. But the, the moral question for me is at what point does this become disproportionate? And when you see thousands of children being killed in Gaza, it fills me with utter horror. And then people say, well, do you condemn it? And I find it very easy to condemn Israel turning off the water, Israel turning off the power. I think it's terrible what's happening in the West Bank with the settlers. I think that the stuff there is completely easy to condemn. But can I hand on heart condemn Israel trying to destroy Hamas after what they did on October the 7th, that is where I'm struggling to find myself saying I condemn it because I believe that they are right to try and 
destroy Hamas. Now, what do you feel about my moral quandary? Well, there is there's a lot of points, very lot, and I think it, this is this will kind of like uh, lay the ground rules for that uh, interview. There is the whole thing about like is it right to defend itself, the condemnation. First of all, let's start with condemnation. Yes. You want my opinion? Yes. Condemning Hamas or condemning Israel? Yes. Completely useless. Mm. Completely useless. Why? You, I condemn Hamas. You condemn Israel. Interview is over. What happened? Nothing. Mm. It is just checkpoint. Like morality checkpoints. But I've interviewed a lot of pro-Palestinians, for example, some of whom will immediately say, I unreservedly condemn the terror attacks of October the 7th, mm -hmm. and then go on to criticize yeah. Israel. And I think that's a very, well, it's a position I can completely respect. Yeah. But I find it much harder to respect a pro-Palestinian guest on my show if they simply resolutely refuse to say yeah that they can condemn the terror attacks. Yeah. Yes. I find that less... I like that he's just fucking turning around and using Bassem Yusuf after glazing him to fucking shit on previous uh, guests that he's One had. One thing that I have noticed, not just on the coverage of these events, the... the now the, they can get together uh, and be like, before, yeah. Before and before, every time this starts, people say, we don't know what's happening. It's a very complicated situation. Right. What is happening now? And for me, as a viewer, if a conflict that's been there for 75 years and the media with all this technology has been covering it and we hear the same exact words, we don't know what's happening. It's complicated. It's a very complex. That is a failure of the media apparatus. That is the failure to themselves and for the audience because why every time this happens, it seems like it is happening from, from, from point zero. And I think to help understand that, I will get to the f October 7th. I will get to the condemnation. I will get to the self-defense. But I think maybe we can do, we, we have like all the time in the world, yeah. and we can discuss, this, could, this interview could be a bookmark, yeah. landmark, for maybe looking at that conflict yeah. in a deeper way that nobody had gone there before. Yeah. We have the views, we have people waiting, yes. you know, as I said, I'm the least qualified to discuss that, but it's an opportunity I'm not, to use listen, it. Listen, I'm not massively yeah, well qualified I, I, myself. Yeah, both of us. I'm, like, a, I mean, I'm, an, look Ari at this. I'm an Irish Catholic, I right? Mean, look at us, yeah, two privileged people, one white, one, mm. one white, white wannabe, <laughs> discussing, <laughs> discussing the, the, the most complex conflict of, mm. of, our, of our history. But Yusuf literally just called it moral grandstanding checkboxing. He isn't agreeing with them. Yeah, I mean, he isn't. Uh, like, I think, I think it would be quite difficult for someone like uh, Bassem Yusuf to just like sit there and and here's the thing even if you're an Arab liberal e even if you're an Egyptian liberal okay even if you no matter what your perspective is if, there, if there's one issue that unites everyone it is that the bloodshed that Palestinians have withstood is completely and utterly Im unimaginable okay like his wife directly is is Palestinian his wife's family are in Gaza that gives him a, a point of personal connection to the, the atrocities, okay? So no matter what happens, I don't know why there's like this fucking weird ad break that cut in in the middle of this conversation, but that's what it is. It doesn't matter what his like own personal perspective is. It doesn't matter what he said in Egypt, for example. Ultimately, um, it doesn't matter what, what his uh, perspective was on the coup, that took place or how violent it was this is no matter what happens on this issue he's always going to have moral clarity it's very difficult for him not to okay i agree the glaze up is annoying but it might just be only some way viewers can humanize arabs and palestinians for once i don't know i think it just basically uh it improves his like liberal credentials that's what happened in that situation here's viewers drop from 50k to 25k those first 10 minutes ruined it it's so strange when westerners talk about arabs as if they are a singular culture ethnicity and language yes it is by design. It is a way to, it is Islamophobia. If you think all Jews are a monolith, you are an anti-Semite. If you think all Arabs are a monolith, well, then you're just every other person in America, okay? All Arabs and all Muslims, as a matter of fact, are a monolith, okay? All members, all, all countries in the MENA region, they're all monolithic. They're all operating under the same, under, under the same interest. They all fucking love one another and they all are anti-Semitic and hate Israel, and, and uh, that's it. What the fuck is happening here? What, is, uh, what are these goddamn ads? Can we compare the 2011 Egyptian coup to the 2016 Turkish coup attempt, or do you think Erdogan can orchestrate such an event to gain more power? I highly think he agreed with Turkish military supremacists in Turkey after that and changed his politics the other way around. Do you think Egypt would be like Turkey now? I think what 
I, I think you can compare the Egyptian coup to the 2016 uh, attempt, but I mean, in the way that I don't know, I uh, will. I don't want to get into this right now. We'll we'll talk about it a little bit more. If you say us atheists are monolithic, I swear to God. Okay, good one. I don't know why there's still uh, this many ads happening here. I can tell you lots of Egyptians have mixed feelings about him. Lots of people are angry with him, but applaud him for using his relative fame standing up to Palestine. We'll see where this goes. Like, as you guys know, I'm no fan. I'm yeah, not a fan of Erdogan, but I've told you before. Anti-Semitism. Yes. America's involvement in Turkey in the in the coup that happened, if it had actually succeeded, Turkey would be in a much worse position overall if Fethullah Gülen was able to uh, if Fethullah Gülen was able to, to seize power, an American puppet who is an Islamist Somewhere. himself, and, and maybe even a worse Islamist than Erdogan, as a matter us, of fact, I, uh, I if one could even imagine such a thing. Feel that. Uh, and I think it is very important to agree on the language, because the word anti-Semite has been used and abused, and most most of the time not f on for the you know, for the good in, um, interest of the mm. Jewish people. Because the first two days of the coverage, I watched the news and, I, and there was a lot of um, protest that was led by Jewish Voice for Peace. Mm. And they were led by people who opposed the Israeli attack on the civilians. And I remember quite well, many of the Republican representatives in Congress I'm came out called and a they Zionist? were calling these... What? The global intifada, the global jihad. I love it when they say jihad. They sound like a horse. Jihad. It's <laughs> very funny. Uh, or they, or they say like these are, and I quote, Iranian-backed jihadists. <laughs> and I said, wait a minute. But most of those people are Jewish. Those people who took over the capital, the same people who took over Central Station in New York, which is known as the biggest civil disobedience event in America in the last two decades, they were all Jewish. And then I find Nikki Haley saying anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism. And then I remember it's like, oh, Jewish people in America are saddled by the fact that they are not citizens of America or citizens of the world, but they are citizens of Israel. And they have to back Israel in whatever they do. And these are not my words. These are the words of John Stewart. He went down and he said, and said like, and he said, it's very, very important to divide these two. And what is very, very interesting... Would you compare that on that specific point to the way that people try and say all Palestinians are responsible and accountable for oh, what Hamas do? Yes, uh, yeah. In other words, I think you can be very critical of Israeli... What is happening? ...and their policies. Yes. Is he understanding? And Benjamin Netanyahu and the politicians. What's going on? But that doesn't mean that you have to take that criticism to innocent Israelis who may have exactly the same criticism. Oh my God, and this here's is Morgan. Very important to have these kinds He's of evolving, he's learning. It, it, the funniest, not the funniest, the saddest thing that I saw is the people that were in so much support of Israel hmm. are anti-Semite themselves. Yes. MTG, 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 uh, Marjorie T uh, Taylor Greene. Hmm. You know, she said like, oh, those are, I send my aides and they took pictures of the protesters. Basically, she's surveilling protesters. And uh, Mary Taylor Greene is very known for a very famous post in 2018 where she blamed the California wildfire uh, fires on a Jewish space laser gun. Do you remember that? Do you remember that? I was just like, oh, they were burned because Jewish investors, Rothschild and Finstein, anything was that ends with time because that's of course sounds Jewish. They put a satellite and shooting laser beams to it's, it's possible. And, and and not just her. You have uh, Steve Scola, uh, 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 Scolalis, uh, Scolalis. Uh, Scolalis. Thank you so much. Uh, he is the, now the the speaker of the house, and he has been invited before in a in a in for an organization that was funded by David Duke, the founder of the KKK. You have Kevin McCarthy, who is the former minority mm -hmm. speaker, uh, uh, leader of, of the Republican Party in the House, and he accused Jewish billionaires of rigging the midterm. So how come those people are accusing us of anti-Semites? So here's the thing. So go, let's go to the equation that Nikki Haley put on Twitter. Mm -hmm. Anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism. No, it is true. People who hate Jews, they're also anti-Zionists. It is true. Mm -hmm. And you could be yeah. someone who hate Zionists, who don't like Zionists, and you are Semite, you could even be Jewish. Mm. And guess what? You could be a Zionist, like those people, 
supporting Israel, and at the same time you hate the Jews, because the chat Jews will not replace us. These echoed in Charlottesville. It did not echo in Gaza. I mean, in Gaza they say war stuff in, in between the bombing on their downtime. But, and these are the same people who are seen with Nick Fuentes. With, uh, right. uh, with, with, well, with, with, with Stephen Bannon. And you know what's Donald most interesting? Trump had him for dinner yes. at Mar-a-Lago. And all of those people are buddies with Benjamin Netanyahu. Mm. So how does this work? Mm. How does this work? Mm. And you know the people who speak against this, like John Stewart, like Bernie Sanders, like uh, Naomi Klein? What do they call these people? What do they call them? Self-hating Self- Jews. Hating Jews. And you know what else they, now <laughs> they call them? They call them capus. Mm. Capus. You know what's capus? Capus, basically these were the Jewish inmate in Auschwitz that were forced by the Nazis to stand as guards on their own inmates. You see how degrading this is. Mm. And this is the way to shut down conversation. Mm. Anti-Semite, Islamophobe, you hate America, you hate the military, you hate Egypt, war on Christmas. This is how you shut an environment that does not allow disagreement is not an environment made for growth. Ask, it's an environment for control. Let me ask you this. On, say the student protests in yes, America, sir. universities. I think he would do a much. He's doing a much better job than I would because he because he's liberal. It's actually part of the DNA of being a student, right? But I do have a problem. I think for as broad an audience as possible, liberalism, like tackling this issue from a liberal perspective, is much better. Which were clearly deeply, deliberately inflammatory and hurtful Mm -hmm. to Jewish people. Secondly, I have a real problem with the students who were beaming direct pro-Hamas slogans onto buildings on campuses in America. You know, I'm all for free speech, and I really am. The whole show is predicated on that. But not to the point where you see Jewish students barricaded into libraries because a mob is descending on them. There is a distinction to me between people who are obviously overtly... I mean, there was a professor at Cornell University who was literally seen in public shouting how exhilarated he felt by the attacks of October the 7th. Mm -hmm. He still hasn't been fired, that guy. Mm -hmm. I think... That crosses a line. Do you? Yeah. I do not like this way. I mean, I can understand why, but I don't condone it. I would never, because you have to understand, these people, again, I'm not supporting them. Uh, I, I just want to make sure about two things. The reason that I started with anti-Semitism, because I wanted to make sure to clear any confusion mm-hmm. that when I speak about Israel, I'm speaking about Israel. Yes. When I'm speaking about Jewish people, I'm speaking about Jewish people. Yes. When I speak about my Zionists, I speak about my Zionists. It was very, because no, I, I think it was yeah, very powerful that ve- you did that. Yeah, I, I have and to be careful. That's the first thing you did because I think it's really important. Yeah, but at the same time, when I tell you why does that happen, it doesn't mean that I condone it. There's a difference between explanation mm. and justification. Those people who are exhilarated, the way that they see, this is the, the, the same uh, reason why people were so happy about the interview. Mm. What do they see? They see Israel as a a criminal state who is killing their people, and in the same time, they are supported by the international community and the the American. They have no guns. They have no superpower backing them. All they have is just the feeling of happiness, like, yes, our enemies that we cannot touch them has been hurt. All they can think about, Mm. that these are their enemies that have been hurt, right? I'm not condoning this, but again, when people were uh, celebrating terrorist attacks, you know, against Western, uh, Western targets. Of course, I don't condone that. But why? Because those people have been, from, from a very young age, what have they seen? They're not being heard by the media. The, the plight and the suffering of their brothers in, Israel, in, in Palestine, in the Arab world, are not being heard. People in Iraq, mm-hmm. you know, like when, when America and Britain invaded Iraq, mm-hmm. right? What, do, what do the Arabs saw? It's like two superpowers are coming in on, on just regular people. So whenever there was like a bomb or like an attack mm-hmm. on no. American troops, people the starving celebrate. refugee tents yeah, started digging Hamas tunnels through Emotions cement with bare are hands. very inflammatory. Yeah. And it is not Good one, right. dude, you got but it. Those people had nothing else. All they can say is just like shout. All they say is like to, to, to rejoice. It is not right. Again, I'm explaining why is this happening because it's like, yeah, if I cannot get you, I'm just going to scratch your eyes. Mm. I'm going to scratch your eyes because, because you've been beating me all the time and you have the whole international community backing you up and all I can do is scream. Mm. Is it right? No. But it is understandable. Again, it's not the right thing. But I, no, it's not like understandable. It's like, oh, I, 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 no. But again, it is an explanation.
This is hard to this is hard for people to understand. They don't get it. They don't get it. They will never get it. You run ads like a capitalist? Yes. Uh I do. I am, dude. I am. I love capitalism. Yum yum yum. Yummy yummy yummy. What changed? Question I always ask people is what changed? Okay. Let's say I'm a capitalist and I advocate for the exact same things that I'm advocating for. Okay. Do you have an argument to the things that I'm advocating for? Or now do you still do you still just say, well, you're fucking bad at capitalism? Like, what are you going to say? This is why, like, hypocrisy baiting is so stupid when you try to, ar like, it's very effective as a rhetorical tool, but it's very stupid, okay? I can defend a position that I don't believe in as well, if you would like, and you would not be able to make this, like, oh, well, you're hypocritical argument in that situation, right? It's also not exactly hypocritical anyway, but it doesn't matter. You know, is, ch is this chatter now anti-capitalist because you got money? Yeah. You don't got no capital. Here you are defending capitalism. You ain't got no capital, motherfucker. So why are you defending capitalism then? You know what I mean? You got no capital and you got no bitches. Here you are, bitchless and devoid of any capital whatsoever. Anyway, yeah, motherfuckers think they, they buy, like, some Tesla stock and think, oh, shit, that's it. That's it, boys. Passive income time. Thinking that they fucking have any say whatsoever. Not the classiest point, but yeah, true, lol. That's my point. It's like, even if I myself am, am, am uh, I don't know, even if you think I'm, like, a capitalist, sure, whatever, who cares? Yeah, I'm a capitalist. Just like... Most people in the Western world. Okay, what changed? What changed in my analysis? You know what I mean? Nothing. So address the actual points rather than just like looking for hypocrisy. Especially because like, let's say I'm a capitalist and I'm actually engaging in anti-capitalist sentiment. Okay? Let's say I'm a capitalist and engaging in anti-capitalist sentiment. I'm a class trader. Okay? Okay, well I still have money. You, on the other hand, are advocating against your best interest and you don't have money. Advocate for your best interest. Rejoicing for the death of innocent civilians in Israel. This is what have the Arabs seen for years in, 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 uh, on the Arab world. For example, if you look up Sidrot Cinema, this is in 2014 when Israel, when Israel was bombing Gaza. Explain how racist some people and are. The Israelis in the Sidro, uh, uh, the kibbutz or the, the settlement, they, were sit, they went on a hill and they had popcorn and they had drinks and they were like watching the show and they were cheering with every rocket coming down. This is what we see. Western me people didn't see that. Well, somebody found a tweet actually of mine yeah. from 2014 mm -hmm. in which I said, at what point does what Israel is currently doing to the Palestinian people become terrorism. Mm. And because I've always said, you know, I've spoken about this a lot over the years and I've always tried to be extremely fair-minded, albeit nobody really wants you to be fair-minded. They want you to take a side. It's but pretty funny that, that like having the most tepid criticism like, against like Israel's apartheid regime absolutely. is seen as like a peace-loving dove. I know what you mean. Yeah, that's how, like that's, that's, that's Google, what the standard is. The standard has already been set. Huh. This is like an, a Jewish wedding. In like he's just such a normal. That's such a normal way to ask. Of like a normal ask question. No, 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 to be clear, I've seen lots of videos. No, 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 but like, I'm talk, not talking to you, Pierce. No, no, no. I'm, I'm no. talking to the Western audience because no, I understand, because I, I want to see like I want to say like this is what they mm -hmm. see. I mean, for example, there is a very famous video for Samuel Abu Zanin, who is like a young kid that he was shot point blank by an Israeli soldier, and he would not allow to have any medical attention. Mm -hmm. And as his dead body was being put into the ambulance, the Jewish settlers were cheering. Mm. So for an Arab audience, this is what we see every day. Mm. Yep. So when they see, oh, we heard them back, mm. we heard their people mm. like they heard back, it is not right. But this is what hate does. Mm. It escalates, it feeds each other. Radicalism feeds it. It is terrible and it is, a, it is just like a vicious circle. So I would like to do something that is very interesting mm. tonight. I want when I invited John Stewart to my show, as much of like a reception that you, if, if you've seen the YouTube, people just like, no, sorry, sorry. we had to cut the five minute standing ovation mm. for broadcast. People were on their feet for mm. five oh. minutes. They could not believe it. I remember uh, John Stewart telling me I could never imagine that a Jewish guy from New Jersey would mm. have that kind of reception in Cairo. Mm. That's so, d okay, John Stewart, classic, classic New Jersey mentality. That's 
anti-Arab sentiment baked into the minds of every single person, no matter how fucking woke they are? Why wouldn't they? Something very Why wouldn't they celebrate you? I want to give. I, I'm, 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 I like telling stories, and I'm going to tell you a very nice story. Tell and away. this is the story, surprise, surprise, of the suffering and the plight of the Jewish people. And I want to say that because it is very interesting when you see the trauma and the suffering that the people on the other side went through, you might understand why, why they're coming through. So this is, see this? Mm -hmm. This is a map of all of the history of the expulsion of the Jews. In Yo! I okay, he, never okay, seen okay, dude. He wa okay, I'm going to say it. He watches the show. And of course, this comes back to the, you know, the whole idea about the original sin that you have. Pull uh, the map out. Trade, uh, uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, the, the, oh, the, reframe the, the, it. Talk the about the Jesus fucking anti-Semitism baked into Christianity. At that time, Jewish people were not allowed to own land. They were just peasants. Even some of the professions are not even allowed to participate. In. But they were allowed to do one thing. Did my Money video on this come out already? Was prohibited uh, I was trying Catholic to get my editors to, to pump in. that out. So what happens when you work in money? You get rich. Not out yet. Never right? mind. And those Jews lived in ghettos. Now, ghettos was not just like isolated neighborhoods and cities. Sometimes ghettos were outside the city. This is like how isolated they were. And in those ghettos, they have to pay gold to the mayor or the governor or the prince or the noble. So they would say, mm, you're getting richer. I need more taxes. So they pay tax. What happens when you have a business and they increase your rent? You increase your service, increase the taxes. Increase the so what happened? What the Christians started to default. And suddenly the image of the greedy Jew was created. Shylock, merchant of Venice. This was the kind of oppression that the Jewish people went through. Fast forward 19th century, there was like the Eastern Jew in Ukraine and, and Russia, and there was the Western Jew, uh, Jews in Europe. Those people in the, East, the Eastern Jews had to immigrate because they were pogroms and they were like, you know, kicked out. And that, at a certain point, the people in the West, especially in England, it's like, mm, there are too many Jews. We need a solution. The solution for what? For the Jewish problem. So it's like, we need to get rid of them. And you know what? Palestine was not even on the, in the A list. Palestine on the, was in the B list because England proposed 6,000 square miles in Uganda for the Jews, 1903. And the reason why Palestine was not on the list, that it was objected by a lot of rabbis that said, like, it's a promised land, but only when the Messiah comes. But uh, there were other options, Argentina, South Africa, Uganda, Madagascar. And eventually, they said, all right, let's do Palestine. So they went to Palestine in 1914. There was 700,000 people living in Palestine, 3% were Jewish. 1917, Belfort Declaration. Arthur Belfort, he called the Jewish people in England that they are alien and hostile race. And the thing is, the only Jewish member of the parliament, of the English parliament, Lord Montenegro, he objects that, like, these are British citizens. They, we should not kick them out. Yeah. So they pushed them, they pushed them, but it was not going fast enough. Came the Nazis. And then it was not about the solution anymore. It was the end losing, the final solution by Hitler, because he needed an answer for the Jewish question. The Jude Freude. And then, the, as you see, the Holocaust happened, the most orchestrated, industrialized, horrible genocide in our modern time. Six million Jews died. So it accelerated, and they went. First of all, they left East Europe, and they went to West Europe, and they went to America, and they were turned down, and they were pushed towards Palestine. So by 1948, right before the declaration of the State of Israel, there were two million people living there. Only 30% of them was Jews. So the whole idea of like a land without a people to a people without a land was a marketing thing. They were already Palestinians. So suddenly, overnight, 1948, there were 1.5 million Palestinians, seven, half of them, three quarters of them were overnight pushed into refugees. Yeah. And this is why it's called the Nakba, the catastrophe. So now we have all of this building up into the mines. And, that, and so, suddenly this was like a conflict, a hate, a problem that we didn't have to do anything with. This was basically pushed on us by the Europeans. Mm -hmm. You see? So this is why it is important to say that. And I'm not saying that just like, oh, let's wipe out the state of Israel. Let's like push up in the sea. No, but it's important when you talk about the conflict, that you talk about the root causes, right? No, there, were a, there was like a vibrant Palestinian culture happening over there. And right now they are erasing this culture. Suddenly I'm seeing of like Israeli feta cheese. 
Israeli hummus. Oh, that's an insult. Israeli hummus. Come on. I mean, take the land, but leave the hummus, man. I mean, come on. I mean, that's, that's not fair. <laughs> you are someone who's always spoken against culture, uh, uh, cancel culture. Yeah. Right now, a whole culture is cancel culture. Yeah, Israeli hummus is, is, uh, is one that strikes at the fucking heart of, of many people. It's like, are there Arab Jews? Of course there are. But hummus, but they, they don't love hummus because they're uh, Jewish. They love hummus because they're Arab. It's crazy. Falafel too. <clears throat> what is this video about the, uh, the Rabah massacre? Okay, we'll, we'll uh, take a look at it. They love hummus because it's the bomb. I mean, it's the best. No, I will never condemn hummus. I love hummus. Dude, actually convert to Pierce Morgan with that conversation? No, I think Pierce Morgan is like over the course of, of uh, many uh, weeks now. I, I think like he's, he's, I wouldn't say he's like an honest person by any means, okay? I think he's a, he's a clout guy. I think he knows that there's a lot of people in the Arab world that watch when he has on people who are who are pro Palestine. It's a it's an avenue that is not like very well represented, but I think in that process maybe he's just like sh- changed his opinion a little bit. Like I don't I feel weird handing it to him in under any circumstance, okay? I feel weird handing it to him. It's like it's like handing it to the top of the hour ad break, you know what I mean? Comes at the top of the hour. If you no longer want to see the three-minute ads, all you need to do is subscribe, which you can do for $5 or for free with a Twitch Prime. Okay? Here's the three-minute ad break now. I'm going to launch off of the ad break that they presented on Talk TV and give you mine. This man, a guy, has to be more well-versed in European history to explain problems in his part of the world while all these Western fuckers keep yapping without reading a single book about the Middle East. Yes, my friend, Schadenfreude. As you know, just as well as I do, that in order to actually fucking make a clear and coherent argument that cuts through the noise against the dominant media narratives, against the dominant cultural forces, you have to be, one, very careful. If you overstep or say something that can be misconstrued, they will immediately shove that down your fucking throat and belittle you. Think about how people have uh, been saying that I am pro-Hamas and pro-baby killing and all this fucking nonsense, despite the fact that I have time and time again condemned it and have been very much anti-baby killing my entire media career, public uh, media career. It does not matter. Two, in order to be able to like explain, truly explain the, the developing attitudes, you also have to be at least relatively... Uh, knowledgeable about the the history of the region and what has happened throughout Jewish time. Journalist for the Guardian newspaper, he wrote a very interesting column last week. In which That's why I always say it's fucking much easier to just like. You could it's much easier to to basically say all Palestinians are terrorists is Hamas. Some of these terrorists have to die. Sorry, sucks to suck because a lot of people already have Islamophobia. And he was they already they already have, have that narrative. Sides unless you really understand the history. Do you, would you agree with that? Would you agree that both sides have legitimate just cause? Not with the methodology that's taken place, and you've given an extremely detailed analysis of the build-up to what happened in 48. To me, it's pretty clear 700, 800,000 Palestinians were displaced from their overnight. homes, and it should never have happened. And that has been absolutely... Technically not the overnight. Cause for so much resentment. But can you, at the heart of this debate, Agree with Jonathan that you could argue there is just cause on both sides. There is a the there is a cause on both sides, but I, I I'm I'm walking on a tightrope here because yeah. I'm not a Palestinian. Yeah. Uh, but from the Palestinian <laughs> point of view, th- there's a lot of people. I mean, there are 2.2 million people. Did you just say the Nakba was a just cause? Can you say it's a just cause? There is 350,000 people living in Israel, and there is like si- six or seven million people living outside. Mm-hmm. Those people, the Palestinians that were pushed out, they do not have the right to go back. Right now, if you meet Palestinians, you'll see them wearing a necklace with a key. That key is their house that they were kicked out from in, in Yaffa and Haifa. You know, like my, my, my wife's family comes from Ramla, which is 50 miles from Gaza. And, and, and according to the law, those people have absolutely no right to go back. Even you, if you are a Palestinian with an American passport, they give you hell in order to go in. And yet, a Jewish person born anywhere in the world, born in Poland, born in the Ukraine, no question as he can jump on a plane, land in Israel, and get the, uh, the, the, the Israeli citizen and take a house that 
most probably belong to a Palestinian. Mm -hmm. So it is not just like, a, it is an ongoing injustice that has been happening. Now, I mean... Where would you criticize, if you're being fair-minded, where would you criticize from 48 onwards the behavior of the Arab side? Well, put yourself uh, in the Arab side. At 1948, you constituted 70% mm -hmm. of the population. Suddenly, the UN is giving you 48% of the land, right? Not just that, I mean, the, the Arab regimes, because they did terribly. And this is the thing, like, Arab nationalism at the height of nationalism, mm -hmm. these people feed on each other. You know, because it's very, very important to have a problem. Mm. Oh, it's Israel. And then, and for what, Israel, oh, it's what did I miss? It's a very good distraction. I Fuck. mean, sometimes I feel that like the Palestinian cause is did very it, useful for both sides to stay did, there as attention. Did he do the classic like, well, the Jews were expelled but, thing? Uh, and this is a very important question because the, in the mind of the... No, Western I'm not going to go back. I'll watch it later. They always thought of the Palestinian resistance or the Palestinian side as like Islamic, as militant. No. As a matter of fact, some of the early suicide bombers were female Christian Palestinians because they, like the IRA, you know, they were fighting for a land. The whole idea of Islamization of the whole cause came very later. As a matter of fact, you will find this very interesting because yes! when I saw this, I did not believe Speak it. on it, motherfucker! This, you know, the Fatah movement, which is the PLO, the course, Fatah. This was their uh, slogan. Can you see? You see... There's a crescent, a cross, and a menorah. And they say, unitary, democratic, non-sectarian. So basically, in the 1960s, Fatah were basically marijuana smoking tree hugger hippies. And yet that didn't work, right? And the thing is, I always hear that like Arabs were giving two, four, so many chances for peace. That is not true. Yes! As a matter of fact, Speak on it, motherfucker! All along history, Israel didn't give an inch of land by peace. And only like took, and only took more land. They gave back Sinai because uh, Egypt like initiated the war. 2006, they went out of uh, south of Lebanon because of the resistance they have. Even the disengagement of, of Gaza, they didn't do it out of the goodness of their heart because they had too much casualties. And even, even, even the Oslo Accords, the peace treaty, the one that Isaac Rabin and uh, got the Nobel Prize for, they did it because of the Intifada. So what is the message that Israel is giving to the Arabs? I will never give you anything with peaceful resolution. You will always have to fight for it. Do you not think that, for example, I mean, Bill Clinton feels this very strongly. That Fuck there Bill was Clinton. There a great deal to be Bill done Clinton is suck my cock. Just in the end. Bitch ass motherfucker, lion ass, donkey. If to this place, there would be a deal, just walked away. That that was the closest that everybody came. And that actually, I mean, could Clinton have done any more than he tried to do then? I am not, again, that's why it's very important mm -hmm. to have people who are much more qualified than me to talk about this, but two things I can say about that. Number one, uh, the, the whole thing about the Oslo Accord, there was a video for Netanyahu who was talking to the settlement offer in 2001, and he was bragging about sabotaging. Mm -hmm. the, he was talking to us like, I sabotage, it's like there was no yeah. peace. Yeah, you've seen that, right? Yeah. And in that video, if you remember, when, when he was saying, like, you have to hit them hard, 2001, no Hamas at the time. Mm. They, we have, they were talking about the Palestinian Authority. We have to hit them, we have to kill them, we have to make them feel the pain. And then one of them says, like, like Bibi, but wouldn't America kind of just like, so what? Mm. The American public is easily manipulated. 80% are with us. It is absurd. And as a new American, mm. where I can have the um, privilege of being retrospectively angry, I said, like, this guy is mocking the government who is, and the people who have been with him all the time. It's like, oh, they can be easily manipulated. They can do uh, arrogance. Even, by the way, even Isaac Rabin, arrogance. Isaac Rabin, the, the, the one who actually did the peace accord, he was known famously said the way to actually beat those children is to break, break their, their fucking the hands. Policies. Yes, they will like get those kids and break their bones on the pavement. So this has it, the whole idea about like no Israel peace loving dove. Peace that motherfucker wasn't fight. a peace lover either. Is a very very actually, bad representation. They still as killed him. It, gone on. The will, the genuine will on both sides for peace, has not existed. No. I think it's been a deceit to the world. Uh, no, I'm sorry. And, and to the relative 
groups of people on both sides. The official and, a, and actually a betrayal of them. The official stand of the Palestinian Authority, and again, I cannot speak, I mean, mm. it is very difficult to do this. The official stand of the Palestinian Authority is that we are just happy with 22% of the land. Just give mm. us like that. Yes, there are people that this, but the thing is, you cannot just say, okay, let's talk about peace. And then you take away my land. Let's talk about peace. And th there's, there's a kind of like passive aggressiveness happening. Oh, let's talk about it, but I'm going to build settlements. I'm going to suffocate your cities and your villages. You see, I think I'm that has been incredibly inflammatory. Yes. Worsening the situation. I think putting back the chance of peace. I mean, Netanyahu, I, I interviewed Netanyahu earlier this year in the middle of the big social protests in his own country. And I couldn't understand what he thought he was doing, except that it seemed to me political expediency that he had to, to get power, uh, you know, again, he had put a bunch of right-wing headbangers into his cabinet who have incredibly bad records, speak in an incredibly incendiary way about uh, Palestinians, for example, and that he did this for power. And then he launched, a, because they were pushing him to do it, a ridiculous assault on the integrity of the Supreme Court, the independence of the Supreme Court. And, and many Israelis rose up. So mm -hmm. Netanyahu is, has become to me a big problem. Right? And, and the people, that all the polling shows that. Israeli people are very unhappy with Netanyahu. I don't think he's ever going to actually want to forge peace. And in fact, I think he was instrumental It's not just Netanyahu. It's not. This is Israel's official government position. That that would just like when it comes to yeah, continuation of endless war in the Middle East, it was, it, was position, position, it was America's official government position until it was not. It did not matter if it was Barack Obama or George W. Bush. Netanyahu is no different than other leaders in Israel in that regard. This includes Yitzhak Rabin as well. There, there's a book, I, I, there, I would say most of his cabinet. There, there's now. a book called The Fear of Peace. It's by, by Moshe Zimmerman. Mm. And he's an Israeli historian. And he said, like, the average Israeli citizen does not have a vision of peace. Mm. Because for 70 years, this is a country that has been the military. The war has been going on for a while. Mm. They have been expanding because of war. The military is taking over. So the whole idea of peace is not even there. Mm. It's not just Netanyahu. Like, What's your opinion like, on the Patrick you know, Dye situation at I Cornell University? Put him in jail, bro. Put his bitch ass in jail. Yes. And I think you tweeted that like that was like uh, a very death threats. Um, kind of reason. Anti-Semitic hate crime death threats. Yeah, Put his bitch ass in jail. Yeah, yeah. but like, fuck I, you, mean? This What's Nath my Nathalie, opinion? In that, he went after Queen Rania, mm. smoking on. And it. you call up shame on Queen Rania. No, I didn't say reasonable. I just said this. Is, I, I did a, a fire emoji. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I just said that what he was saying. Yeah. I mean, is it, I was going to ask you about Queen Rania. Let's ask about since yeah. you've raised it. Yeah. Because Queen Rania accused the West. No, of this is an issue regarding singular Israeli leaders. It might have been all of them, but it has nothing to do with. Israeli state. And the world is not okay. even calling for a ceasefire. So the silence is deafening. And to many in our region, it makes the Western world complicit. Uh, now, other people said, well, OK, if you feel that strongly, why aren't you taking in any Palestinians? Why is Egypt not taking ah, Palestinians? Why does the Arab the world want to page. constantly attack Israel without actually offering any place to go for the yeah. Palestinians. Imagine those fucking dogs in leadership are actually fucking exactly representative of the people's opinion. Starts third war three. This is the war solution. These are Palestinians. These are their land, mm. and then suddenly take them. Why? So they've been basically kicked around from their homes, and now another country should take them. You see what will happen? Imagine this. Mm. Now. And because Israeli official has been talking openly about this. Mm. It's like, why don't they just go in Sinai? Why they go? Mm. You know what would happen? Those people are going to be pushed in Sinai. And with any population, two million people, they are living in refugee camp. What do you think will happen? Unrest, mm. uh, uh, chaos. Mm. And then after a few years, the Western media will come with their cameras like, oh, look at those Arabs. Oh, they're killing each other. Oh, Israel is good that they got rid of them. And then they will go to the West Bank. And so they those 3.5 million people push into Jordan. This, the whole idea, why does Jordan take them? Why does Egypt take them? The same question. You, Europe has 44 countries. Why don't they take Israel? America has 50 states. Why don't they give them Florida? I mean, they, we seem to complain about Florida the whole time. Why don't they just like give uh, Israel? <laughs> the whole idea was like, oh, you're Arabs, you're all the same. No, no, no. Because what would happen then? So Israel will move into Jordan? It's like, oh, Saudi, why don't you take the Jordan? What do you mean this guy smokes? This is not a solution. He's been saying the same shit I've been saying. I'm not taking a position yeah. either way. Let me ask you, 
directly. But I want to say something about what Queen Radia said. Okay. The whole idea about like the West. Yeah. I think that in three weeks, Israel morally corrupted the West like no other. I think the West will have a lot of time to recover because for years, the West has been telling us, oh, look, we're liberal. We're all about human rights. All are equal. Adopt our values. And then suddenly, but you, you don't want to even to cease. We don't want to even tell Israel to stop. And suddenly we wake up and we found McDonald's are giving free meals to the Israeli because like nothing will make you feel better after killing a bunch of okay. Palestinian okay. kids than a happy meal. You know? Then happy meals. <laughs> um, yeah, Bassem Youssef is a great communicator. Obviously, he's a fucking uh, long... I mean, bro, he's he's been in media for almost as long as I've been alive. You know that, right? Um, so, of course, even though we say the same exact things overall, uh, he's going to be much better at saying it, I think.